Hey everybody, welcome back to Historical Ish. This is episode 6 of the Ancient Mysteries Iceberg, where we will be going over the second half of the third tier. So let's jump right in. Number 11. Plautonian at Hierapolis. Also known as Pluto's Gate, this was where a Plautonian, or a religious site, dedicated to the god Pluto was. It is located within the ancient city of Hierapolis, near Pamukkale, in modern-day Turkey. The site was discovered in 1965 by archaeologists who have noted that both the Plutonian and the nearby Apollo's Oracle of Hierapolis were built atop the remains of a seismic fault that were thought to be the gateway of Hades. Though the exact dating of the site is unknown, we do know that the city itself was founded around the year 190 BC and used continuously until finally being destroyed in the 6th century AD by earthquakes. As mentioned before and similar to the Oracle of Delphi, the site sits on top of a cave that emits toxic gases, which is why it was used as a ritual passage to the underworld. People believe that the gases from the cave were released by Pluto, god of the underworld, as anything that was nearby would end up dying. The priests of the area would hold their breaths and descend into the cave and find small pockets of oxygen within that would allow them to make the citizens believe that they were in fact immune and solidify themselves with their divine protections. The ancient historian Strabo described the gate as follows. Any animal that passes inside meets instant death. I threw in sparrows and they immediately breathed their last and fell. The priests sold birds and other animals to the visitors so that they could try out how deadly this enclosed area was. Visitors could obviously, for a fee, ask questions of the Oracle of Pluto. At the time, this was a mystery of where these gases came from, as many believed that it was from the gods. But today we realize that these gases just came from geothermal activity in the area, so not much more explanation is needed. Number 12, the Antikyther Mechanism. This is something I touched on briefly in an earlier video, but wanted to dive deeper into here. The Antikyther mechanism is the oldest example of an analog computer and was used to predict astronomical positions and eclipses decades in advance, as well as track the four-year cycle of the Olympic Games. Using different scanning techniques, archaeologists were able to see that there were 37 bronze gears within that allow it to follow the movement of the moon and the sun through the zodiac to predict eclipses and model the irregular orbit of the moon. This irregular motion of the moon was actually studied by Hipparchus of Rhodes in the 2nd century BC, and speculation points to him using the machine as a basis for his studies. Further theories suggest that there is a significant portion of the device missing that was used to calculate the position of the five classical planets. Dating of the device is as old as 205 BC, and what's wild about that is that machines with similar complexity did not appear again until the astronomical clocks of Richard of Wallingford and Giovanni de Dondi in the 14th century. Due to this, many outlandish theories have emerged ranging from the existence of time travel, the Anunnaki leaving it, it coming from Atlantis, evidence of intelligent design, you name it and there's probably an Antikythera mechanism theory attached to it. Number 13, the lost mine of Ophir. King Solomon ruled on or around 970 BC and is one of the most recognizable characters from the Old Testament. He was known for many different things during his four-decade rule, but one thing he was most known for was his wealth, which is claimed to have originated from the mine of Ophir. Allegedly, King Solomon had so much gold that by today's standards would have been worth roughly $60 trillion, but nobody knows for certain where he got this absurd amount of gold because the Bible does not go on into specifics about where the mine was located. Scholars believe Solomon worked closely with another regent, Phoenician King Hiram, and since the Phoenicians were great sailors with outposts all over the Mediterranean, it is almost impossible to pinpoint the location of this mine. Some notable theories about the location of this mine include Africa, being the gold mines in Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, or Tunisia, although there have been zero evidence dating anything to the time of Solomon. There's also some theories about it being in Asia from the Dravidians in southern India, and due to some similar root words and common names for rivers, it is often tied to this as well. There are even some weirder theories that suggest it was located in the Americas, which, as you can already tell, is pretty far-fetched. Archaeologists have claimed on multiple different occasions to have found the mine, but it's almost impossible to know for certain if these are the actual mine used by Solomon to create his legendary fortune. Number 14, Woodhenge. Woodhenge is a Neolithic construction in present-day Wiltshire, England, that consisted of six concentric rings of timber dating to around 2500 BC. 
the mysterious site is located only two miles from Stonehenge. Due to the land being reworked over time, researchers are not exactly sure about what the site looked like, yet there still seems to be an agreement that the site was uncovered without a roof or ceiling. Towards the center of the circles is a cairn of flint, as well as a pit which contained the remains of a crouching three-year-old child with a split skull. And during the German Blitz in World War II, an explosion destroyed the remains of this child, so they are not able to be examined further, but the two theories around the cracked skull were either a part of a sacrifice or due to the weight of the dirt on the body. There seems to be some sort of connection between Stonehenge and Woodhenge, and was originally thought to be a prototype for Stonehenge, but after further research revealed that Stonehenge was constructed about five centuries earlier. Though Woodhenge still seems to point to the summer and winter solstice just as Stonehenge does. Another theory suggests it was used for ceremonial purposes or a place of offering due to discoveries of pottery items, animal bones, deer antlers, picks, and flint tools all placed around the bases of these posts. In 1966, another circle, now called the Southern Circle, was found 230 feet north of Woodhenge. We still don't know much about Woodhenge in particular, but I do think it's really intriguing how close these Woodhenge, Stonehenge, and the Southern Circle are to each other. Number 15, the Anunnaki. So the Anunnaki are a group of deities or gods that are found in a couple of ancient Middle Eastern civilizations, most notably the Sumerians, um, as well as the Akkadians, Assyrians, and the Babylonians. Now keep in mind that the Sumerians are the oldest known civilization in our recorded history, roughly starting around 4500 BC. Now 14 clay tablets from the Sumerians detailed the stories of their gods, which are, like I said, the Anunnaki. Now, there's a lot of mystery that surrounds these mythical figures, but there's one wild theory that I thought I'd share. So, the story goes that every 3,600 years, their planet Nibiru, at the ends of our solar system, would orbit very close to Earth. Apparently, they couldn't produce enough gold on their home planet, and they needed gold in order to fulfill their needs, whether that be with advanced science or magic, who knows. They didn't have enough gold on their planet, so they sent ships to Earth where gold was relatively abundant. They arrived roughly 445,000 years ago and built a city called Eridu in Mesopotamia, and there was a garden within the city which was named Eden. Sound familiar? They used another alien race to have slaves extract gold, and they eventually went on to war because they rebelled against the Anunnaki, but the Anunnaki eventually won. They then wanted to create another race that was intelligent but also inferior so they would be good slaves. That's where the humans come in. The first successful human was Adamu, and there were many mishaps while doing this, creating the well-known Nephilim, for example. This can also explain why there seems to be a gap between the evolution of apes and humans, as the explanation provided by the tablet says that DNA from the Anunnaki was mixed with the ancient ancestors of humans. The Anunnaki taught humans agriculture and architecture, but eventually it fell out of favor and were expelled from Eden and the city. It is said that their home planet came close to Earth again, and the gravitational pull caused the Earth to heat up and the glaciers melt, causing Noah's Flood, or the Epic of Gilgamesh Flood, or a worldwide flood in wiping many cities off the face of the Earth. Eridu and Eden were then submerged. The Anunnaki then left and instructed humans to construct temples that align with constellations, and also instructed them to keep a monarchical governmental system to keep the purest Anunnaki blood ruling over the others. So pretty much in summation, there's a group of people that believe that the Anunnaki were actually aliens that came to Earth, tampered with the genetics of humans, and created civilization, which is what we have today. They're known today as ancient astronaut theorists, and I think it's interesting to think about with all the similarities between all the ancient writings, but in reality, I think all these writings are just mythical figures made up to make sense of the world around them. I don't think that these were actually historical writings written in the time, and I think we kind of just have to take them how they are. Number 16, Hyperborea. Hyperboreans in Greek mythology were people who lived in the farthest north point of the world. Although Hyperborea was supposedly the farthest north point on land, they inhabited a sunny and temperate climate. It is also said that the sun only rose and fell once a year, which could possibly place the location of the Hyperborea somewhere in the Arctic Circle, but don't really know. The Hyperboreans were believed to live beyond the snowy Riffian Mountains, and other ancient writers believed the home of the Boreas or the Riffian Mountains were in a different location. The first person to talk about the Hyperboreans was Herodotus, so right off the bat we kind of have to question whether or not this was an actual place or just a legend made up by Herodotus and told later in many different myths and legends. Throughout history, there's been many different speculations on where Hyperborea was, 
and whether it existed or not. Some speculations include they were north of the Alps or the Ural Mountains. Some speculate that it could have been the peoples located on Britain, or it could have been the Vikings and Danish people because they seem to be the closest that match up to the descriptions that have been told through the legend. According to legend, the Hyperboreans were said to live in complete happiness, and they said to have lived for a thousand years and were around 10 feet tall. They were white and also noted to have had fair hair. Personally, I think the most likely is that it was just a legend made up by Herodotus, but it could be true. It's obviously very hard to pinpoint the exact location, given that it's the farthest north point in the world and a sunny and temperate climate, so it doesn't exactly match up. But yeah, we'll just leave that one there. Number 17, Newgrange. Now, this is where it starts getting cool because these are some items that I've never really heard about, and so doing some research is pretty interesting. Newgrange is a Neolithic structure that's actually dated older to Stonehenge to 3200 BC in Ireland. It's a stone mound monument that's corridors align perfectly with the winter solstice and even portrays other astronomical events. It's said to be a burial ground for multiple people and the burned and unburned bones of graves or offerings are found in the middle circular chamber accessed through a long entrance hallway. There are also many other passages for light to enter and many incredible figures of architecture and art around and within the structure. In mythology, Newgrange is said to be a passageway or portal to another world, specifically the other world in Celtic mythology, which is just the realm of deities and possibly also the realm of the dead. Stuff like this always blows my mind because apparently it tells perfect time and for ancient civilizations to have this type of power or knowledge, I should say, is very intriguing to me, and I think that's the main mystery here. And just as a side note, I think a lot of people have all these mysterious ideas about ancient civilizations getting knowledge from some unknown source, but I really think we need to give credit where credit's due. A lot of ancient civilizations did have the knowledge and power to do such things, and I think it's a really cool idea. And I think it's fascinating that they were able to construct such structures that are still accessible to humans today. Number 18, Roman dodecahedron. Usually made of bronze and sometimes even stone, these 12-sided objects have knobs at each corner and each face has a hole in the middle of them. There's a lot of mystery that surround these objects as over 100 of these objects have been found in areas that were once part of the Roman Empire. But researchers are still searching for the answers for their origins, function, and use. They have been found all over Europe from Wales, Hungary, Spain, Italy, but mostly in Germany and France, and they range in size between an inch and a half to four and a half inches, and believed to be dated between the 2nd and 3rd century. There are a wide variety of theories, although none are supported by any sort of proof, and these theories include leveling devices, astronomical calculations, religious artifacts, and even candlestick holders. Not much else is known about these devices, but I do think it would be pretty funny if they happened to be just kids' toys that babies could play with or even put wooden logs through different size holes instead of some impressive engineering marvel that everybody thinks that they are. Number 19, the Bent Pyramid of Sneferu. Sneferu was an old kingdom pharaoh who constructed the Bent Pyramid around 2600 BC and is one of the more unusual pyramids from ancient Egypt. The pyramid was built on the Nile's west bank and about 25 miles south of Cairo and was one of the first pyramids not to be built on fertile land. It's known as the Bent Pyramid due to the change in angle about 160 feet up the pyramid where it shifts from a 54 degree angle to a 43 degree angle as you can see here. It's notable because it's the only pyramid in Egypt out of the like 120 of them that has an altered slope. Two popular theories about why it's bent include reducing the slope after Sneferu heard about the collapse of a pyramid in Medum, 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 Medum. It's Medum. Two popular theories about why it's bent include reducing the slope after Sneferu heard about the collapse of a pyramid in Medum, or that due to the pyramid taking longer than expected, he lowered the angle to complete construction quicker. Many believe that there are still unseen or undiscovered rooms inside that might hold the real reason for the architecture and why the pyramid was built like that, but I tend to lead more towards architectural and structural design being the main reason for the bent shape. And finally, number 20, the mystery of the Pleiades across various civilizations. 
The Pleiades are a cluster of stars or a constellation that are recorded in many different ancient civilizations. The civilizations range from the Greeks, Scandinavians, various African tribes, the Aborigines of Australia, and even Native American tribes. All cultures illustrate the stars as being the seven sisters or the seven girls, and the story goes that all seven sisters are the daughters of the Titan Atlas or the equivalent depending on the culture, and in order to protect them from the hunter Orion, Zeus transformed them into stars. But the legend notes that one of the sisters fell in love with a mortal, and that's why only six of them are visible today. What's most interesting about this is that every culture that has this story has the constellations in the story with seven sisters instead of the six visible stars. Also notable, around 100,000 years ago, when humans were first believed to have been living in Africa, the seven stars in the constellations would have been easily visible. This in itself is pretty outstanding because the main theory of how all these cultures share the same story isn't from European migration or expansion. It suggests that everyone's ancient ancestors in Africa knew the story, and as humans migrated around the globe, everyone kept the same tradition and oral history. There are also many different ancient artifacts all over the world which depict the seven stars, including what is believed to be artwork depicting the seven stars of the Pleiades in Gobleki Tepe. There is actually a big following of zodiac-like astrology groups that believe the Pleiades have a spiritual alien race that gives humans love and are more spirit-oriented than humans, but that's another story. The Pleiades are also mentioned multiple times in the Gospel account in the Bible. There seems to be an extreme spiritual connection between the star system and ancient and modern humans. It's pretty fascinating. I think we'll have to do another video on this sometime in the future because there's a pretty wide range of theories about the Pleiades. Well, that about wraps up Tier 3. I just want to say that I've really enjoyed doing this series and I really appreciate everybody watching and following along. If I've missed anything or if you have any other theories related to any of the topics, please share them down in the comments. I love reading these types of things. I learn something every time somebody comments something, so it's just fantastic. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you aren't already, just so that you can follow along when I update new episodes. And at the very least, thanks for watching.